Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, we interview inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. If you love yoga, movement, meditation, and finding flow in your daily life, then this is the podcast for you. I hope you're having a great day today. I think we've reached the peak of winter in Melbourne here, at least in regards to how cold it is. Just looking outside the window, it's a bit of a rainy day, but that's all right because I've got plenty to do and to talk about with you today. This episode is a recorded conversation between myself, my lovely wife and co-host Joe Stewart, Jamie Malu Thomas and Sarah Jones. Jamie and Sarah are the creators of Wayapawadak, a new modality that integrates movement, breath, meditation, Australian indigenous wisdom, and a connection to the elements of nature and the land. I think the work that Jamie and Sarah are doing is really important. And as you'll hear in this episode, they're spreading way up a wedding into schools, youth groups, men's groups, and even into prisons. So I think they're doing some really wonderful, important work. Now, just before we get into the conversation, I just wanted to ask for you to please rate, review, or subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or wherever you download your podcast from. It really helps other people find us so we can spread the word far and wide. Anyhow, this is enough from me. Let's get on to the conversation. I um, personally grew up in Far East Gippsland. That's my traditional homelands. Um, I'm Gunai and my clan and uh, the Krautungalung people, but I also have connections to the western part of Victoria, on my Aboriginal side through my grandmother, people don't speaking language of the Māori people, or sometimes called the Kunishmar. And I am Welsh, Canadian, Australian. My parents are Welsh heritage and they moved to Canada, had us as a family, and then we all moved over to Australia when I was about 14. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so would you like to tell us a bit about how your childhood experiences shaped the development of Why the Work and brought you to where you are today? When I finally got the chance to talk to Sarah about building a foundation and building a structure to do that, I told her my story of growing up on country and I grew up in and around little places called Club Terrace, it's nothing like Club Med, um, <laughs> and Bem River, and so my traditional homeland is still very bushy and lots of rainforests and beautiful beaches and, you know, not many people there. So I was fully immersed in, in nature, but also our traditional stories for that area, being told those stories. So I had, I was lucky growing up with that and, you know, my, my parents, we caught a lot of our own food, lived off the land, you know, like fishing, we used to fish a lot and catch rabbits and my mum was, was an amazing gardener always fresh vegetables pretty much all year round. So we used to harvest the chicken every couple of weeks, you know, eat fresh organic chicken and stuff like that. So we had a fairly, had a fairly good upbringing being out on country. And I guess as we got, as I got older, I sort of moved away from that a little bit because with a lot of societal issues around identity and you have to have this to be this and you got to keep up with the Joneses and, you know, that whole philosophy of having a, a house with a picket fence with a car and then, you know, come the 80s and the 90s where I was like, have the Imani suits and the, the perfumes and the shoes and, the you know, all that sort of stuff. I sort of got sucked into that sort of lifestyle a little bit where I wasn't being aware of my consumerism which goes against our my aboriginal concepts you know aboriginal people and aboriginal culture where they they were the consumer consumer awareness people because they they didn't take what they didn't need and they looked after the environment so yeah i, th I think that how it got to where we are was looking at my growing up and then looking at my traditional culture knowledge you know way up was a way of framing that all up and presenting it and being more aware about our own present I remember um, just uh, when I was looking at your website and doing some research, you had a little um, story about how when you're working as a youth worker, you had to like pick up some kids and you were taking them to, was it for a traditional dance workshop yes. or something? Yes. And do you want to tell us a little bit about yeah. that experience? I, I think for me, when we were, you know, because of the concept of, of invasion and dispossession and attempted assimilation, the reclamation of our traditional cultural languages and stories and dances was a, it's been a big part of my life since coming back to my grandmother's country 26 years ago. And I used to teach the kids traditional dance and putting it all back together 
and putting all that knowledge back together was a very slow process. And I remember one night I'd spent, you know, a whole day working as a drug and alcohol worker, going to court for clients and going, travelling around, you know, doing a nine-to-five job, but then having to get in a bus after work and pick up all the kids from different all around town, driving out to the mission. And when we got into town, the kids just, it was about six o'clock, and the kids just got out of the bus and just all ran off. I just lost it, yeah. <laughs> and one of my uncles, Uncle Rob, sort of said, well, you know, you need to chill out yourself, you know. Well, you're going to remind yourself why you're here, what are you teaching these kids? And, oh, you know, teach their culture and, you know, what's that about? You know, and it's about being grounded and being respectful and being aware and connected. So basically got the kids to come, got them in, got them to take their shoes off, and I went through a meditate, like a visualisation. I'm going to close their eyes and sort of talk them through the elements of our stories about our connectivity to everything. And, and then got them to stay standing still and grounded and then got them to sort of do the movements of what, it, what, the, what that would look like. And, you know, from there it just sort of organically grew. That's taking the traditional dance concepts and putting them into movements, but the movements just being about who we are and our environment sort of led to organically teaching that over the 18 or so years before and then I met Sarah and Sarah really had the vision to say that's you know basically that's a full-blown modality that you're teaching and it's got so much resonance to it and it's so important and the knowledge and I'm like really (laughs) no (laughs) it's just something I just do you know and and I shared it with school kids and so when I've done individual workshops and I'd do it and even to a point I was doing it out in the eastern suburbs and with a group of Aboriginal kids and after about six, eight weeks they could do it all, eyes closed, doing the whole 14 elements to the narration without even, you know, they were just all in synchronicity, you know, they were all doing it at the same time without even having their eyes open. So that was really Sarah's foresight to turn it into a shareable construct of a modality with the world. So I feel pretty much full of gratitude for that opportunity. Thanks. <laughs> I think it's so often the case when it's just something that came out of you and it's just something that you do, you don't elevate it to the level of like, oh, I've created a new movement modality. It's like, this is just what I do. And so sometimes it does take someone else's eyes to go, no, this is amazing. Like other people need to learn this and share this as well. I'd love it if you could take us through what the 14 elements are and describe the technique for people who haven't had any experience of it, if that's yeah, all yeah. right. So the... The 14 elements are really based on us as humans and our awareness. So we teach it from an environmental perspective, so it talks about how the environment is doing its own thing. So the 14 elements first honour the creator. So whatever you see or connect to the creator, we don't say what a word is or what it looks like or what the story is. That's your own personal journey to connect to it, but it's about honouring that the creator is giving us everything we have from the stars to the water to the earth and all the energy that's here. So the movements of the creator are all associated with that gratitude of being connected to a creation or the creator, however you see it. And then there's the sun. The sun is the second element of Wayapa of the 14 elements and it's about honouring the cycles of the sun. It's about honouring being the centre of our universe and just how we cycle around it and it's about observing the sun's cycles as well and we always we always talk about ancient cultures that observe that whether it be the Stonehenge or the Egyptians or one of the Aboriginal stories here is that there's a stone arrangement that's it's about 12,000 years old and it's like 10 times older than Stonehenge you know twice as old as the, the Egyptian pyramids but no one even knows about it. So our, our ancestors were honouring those cycles and had a concept of Pythagoras's theory even long before Pythagoras came along and understood that. <laughs> so you know that Aboriginal people, you know, were highly intelligent and evolved humans as opposed to uh, they walked around barefoot, naked and used stone tools. So, yeah, so the third element is the moon. So it's about honouring the cycles of the moon and having an awareness around what the moon is doing every day. So the 28-day cycle is about being connected into that and being observing how the moon is interacting with our planet but also with us, so physiologically, emotionally how having that awareness and and having that gratitude for what the moon is doing. Then there's the land. So it's purely about honouring the space in which we travel across or sit in. So it's about the creation of the the landscape around you. So when we talk to people about Wayapa, we can say Wayapa to you can be one space. It could be a space that's very special to you or it could be a lot of spaces. So when you do the visualisation and do the meditation, you visualise yourself being there. So if I was to do it now, my, my place that I generally I mostly go to is up in Far East Gippsland where there is oceans and there's mountains and valleys and you know, there's been shifting plates that have 
caused, you know, different outcrops and things like that. So it's about honouring that the earth in general, where you connect to, and it could be, like I said, multiple places. Then we have the lightning. So we go into the sky and observe the lightning energy and, you know, talk about, you know, how lightning is beneficial for Mother Earth and why it's an important mood for her and it's an important tool for her. So, you know, the creation of nitrate from nitrogen as it forms from the lightning and how lightning starts fires and, and you know, how fires are a natural part of the earth as well. It's a natural part. And I think we get a bit scared of that as humans because, you know, it can be have such devastating effects but not understanding our relationship with fire. So we, we bring people back to that awareness with, with lightning and fire. Then we have the rain and it is about honouring water and where water comes from. As you go through the journey of Waiapa, you start to learn about these elements and you start to connect to them and understand the history of them. I told a class of kids this morning that the water that we're drinking here today is the water from the beginning. This water has never left this planet and our ancestors drank that and the people after us will drink this water. So what's the quality of water going to be like in another 10,000 years or 100 years? <laughs> you know, so there's a gratitude for then what you tip down your sink or how you interact with the plastics in the ocean and rah, rah, But then also about, we always say, well, when you watch the, the weather, the weather guy always says, I'm really sorry, guys, it's going to be raining for three days. Instead of saying, yes, it's going to be raining for three days, you know, and the power of word and thought then affects our well-being. So if people are feeling depressed and angry at the rain, then that's what you're going to be. It's so a manifestation of your thoughts. So having a full understanding and connection to having gratitude for all the elements is a really important part of Waiapa. So the rain is about observing the different directions that rain comes from and the purposes and, and the story behind it. Then we have the wind. Again, another really important element because of what it's doing environmentally for mother earth it, it's her way of shifting things around so nutrients and seeds and moving oxygen around and there's so many different amazing stories or knowledge around each of the elements and so it's about honoring the, the the energy and the power of the wind then we go into the tree which is if you can see a bit of a story forming here that's all interconnected so everything needs each element to continue to grow so we go from the wind that picks up that seed that travels the seed in the seed falls into the earth that falls into number four and then obviously the, the earth and the water and the sun and the moon all help that tree grow so they're all interconnected so the, the tree is about honoring the oxygen the materials the foods the fruits from the tree and it's about people are respecting that and then from the tree we go into the next three elements after that are, is the air element so it's about observing all things that fly so we often talk about the eagle but it could be a butterfly or an insect or something that flies and it's about when you connect to the flying element, it's about getting up out of your environment and looking at it from a bigger picture, and not just your own backyard, but what else is happening that I need to be aware of. We go into the land, the land element. It's about observing all the animals that live on the land and how we need to be aware that they're all there for a purpose and the intricacies of how each one of those need each other. And then from the land, we go into the water element and that's about observing things that live in the fresh water, the salt water, you know, all water creatures. The three main ones that we talk about when we do way up is the eagle, the kangaroo and the eel, but it could be a dove, it could be a deer, it could be a fish. It's about observing that those three spaces of our planet have been occupied a lot longer than we've been here. So things have been flying around, living on the land and swimming in the water before humans were even here. And then after that, there's we go into the hunter and the gatherer. So it's about the third, uh, 12th and 13th element is about honouring that our ancestors were hunters and gatherers. And it's not about putting a gender uh, stereotype to them, but generally, if you talk of generalisations, the hunter was the man, the gatherer was the woman in a lot of villages, but not always the case. And it talks about the different ways and the knowledge that those hunters and gatherers had of their environment to, to live on it respectfully and to to go out and to catch food or to dig for food or to survive and thrive and then the last element is the child and when you think about the 14 elements and we started with the creator we end with the child because the child is both the child but it is also the creator because it will create the environment which the next generation will will take up so just like we really are all the children and we become the hunters and gatherers. And then it's about passing on that knowledge to the next generation, the next generation, the next generation. So Waiapa from looking at all 14 elements of how they're all interconnected to, to us as humans and how we need to get back to observing and having gratitude and understanding that. I think one of the biggest misconceptions, and I talk about this a lot, is that humans have this ego, is that we'll destroy the planet to think we're that powerful. <laughs> 
when really we'll destroy ourselves. The planet will still be here long after we've destroyed the water and the air quality and the food sources. And to think that we're that powerful, it's a bit, it's a bit funny, really. I always have this joke with the, the kids and that, to say, well, the cockroaches are just waiting to take over. You know, <laughs> like when humans are gone, they, you know, the cockroaches are driving a car saying they had their chance. Because, you know, it is about, we talk about ego and it's about, you know, we were talking about that before in there about, you know, I need this because that'll make me like this or the old saying, you know, instead of saying the manners maketh the man, we say the suit maketh the man. Which one's better for you? <laughs> Which one's cheaper? <laughs> you know, having better manners or, you know, having a suit with poor manners. So I think that as a, as society has is, is de-evolved, and I'll use that word, we haven't evolved and we're having a conversation about evolution and about evolving as people and humans on the planet. I think what WIAPA does is it resets the conversation to say that we've had the answers before. You know, we're just ignoring that knowledge. I always use the, the philosophies around even medicine. We call ancient medicine, we call it alternative or new age. How does that work? <laughs> that's, that, that, that's not even like it's just, oh, the new age medicine. It's like it's actually the oldest, the oldest form of medicine. <laughs> and we're calling it new age. And I mean, there's all sorts of financial agendas as to why that stuff is but so yeah WIAPA is about reframing ancient knowledge and connectivity and responsibility because it's not just about our own personal well-being and wellness this is about intergenerational wellness I think that that's what's not being talked about in any other modality Mm -hmm. that's that's actually on the table I'd love to go into that a bit more because innately I feel like there is this connection between personal well-being and taking care of yourself and kind of having the energy to take care of your community and to give out but also I don't know sometimes there's this perception that it's like really selfish to take care of yourself and put yourself first when like there's so many other problems in the world and I know a lot of people don't put themselves first because they are so driven to help others Mm. and that's often not very sustainable and What's your kind of feelings? It's definitely a balance. It's definitely a balance between making sure, and it's the classic stick with me here. I'm good for analogies. <laughs> and What's, What's he going to say it? now? What's he going to say now? When you're on an aeroplane and they say, a mask going to drop from the ceiling, put yours on first before you help someone else, right? So it is about making sure you can't, unless you're safe, you can't help someone out and it's also about if you're living a really well and healthy lifestyle and i've seen it so many times a lot of my uncles and family members the older ones they've all died at a really young age because they put their own health last there's one uncle i remember was really sick and he walked into the health service and he's in his early 50s and he was really sick and there was a line of about 20 people and he just went home because he said no nah, they all need to see a doctor before me um, yeah, he passed. But he was such an inspiration to so many people because of all the good work that he did. So to me, there's that real balance between making sure that you're looked after and then the well-being of everything else you know, resonates from that. And when when you look at Waiapa and you look at it from a, in a traditional village, so I say to, say to our kids is that I say to them, there's not going to be any inheritance. There'll be nothing left for you. I will give you all the knowledge that you need to survive and to get the things that you need to do. So in a traditional village, if you're a child and depending on your gender and wherever you're from, you might become a hunter or you'll be a gatherer. So that you'll go when you get that time. They will give you all that knowledge and that knowledge will then help you to, to thrive in when the elders pass then you'll become that hunter and gatherer and then you'll become that elder. So this intergenerational passing on of knowledge. So rather than accumulating wealth, it's about what can we do to look after these people from a wellbeing perspective? What do they need? And look, there's enough accumulated wealth of the world and there's enough, if you believe in a construct of money, it's just a figment of our imagination anyway, that we use as a trading commodity, that the world should be, everyone on the planet should be well. Gandhi said it, you know, the world provides enough for everyone's needs, not everyone's greeds and the whole disconnection thing. So one of the things that we teach in my app is not, you don't have to, as I said before, there's no seven magical points that you have to do to be a WIAPA worker or to be a WIAPA person or to be WIAPA. It's about saying, well, what can I encourage other people to do from a wellbeing perspective that you don't need to have lots of money or these clothes or it's about looking at i guess as you guys would know it's about what's between your ears is where wellness really comes from and how you see things and yes there are other things happening out there i mean 
as an Aboriginal person, we were having this conversation in this country around sovereignty and treaty and can have all these conversations, but what does it really mean and what does it really amount to? Self-determination of, our, of ourselves has to come from self, not from government, not from somebody else, not from Sarah can't fix me, the government can't fix me. If I've got diabetes, it's because of what I'm putting in my mouth or if I'm going to jail, it's because I stole a car or I'm in control of that. So how do I part that stuff onto other people to take up? There's so many different ways you can use Wayapa to make wellness resonate out from you. And it's about saying to people, you know, there always going to be that constant, oh, but you've got this money and you haven't got that money, or you know, it's not always about the money. It's about, well, how did I get that? I might not come from, come from poverty, but I have a couple of cars, I own a house, and, well, the bank owns a house, but, you know, <laughs> but it's about saying, well, but I took those skills that I was taught and I put them into action. I can give you these skills so you can have this if you want that. So it's all about perspective of what is richness and wellness, I suppose, and how that can be sort of shared. I'm intrigued because there's obviously so much philosophy behind this and so much deep knowledge. When you're introducing it to someone for the first time, how much, like, do you start with the physical practice? Do you start with the meaning behind it? Do you start with the basics of both and then get deeper as people go on? How do you, how do you structure this? It's basically providing the knowledge first around the Indigenous concepts, Indigenous wisdom, thinking, then sharing the practice. So because it really is about having the understanding first to be able to then get the deep immersion or the deep connection with the practice. And I think that a lot of the times you, we tend to do things without really knowing why we're doing them. And, you know, we find that with YAPA, you really need to know all of the concepts and the knowledge and the understanding about what the, all of the elements are and why they're important to then really connect in with the actual practice itself. So we teach all the knowledge first, then the practice, and then as people start going deeper and deeper into longer courses or becoming a practitioner, then it keeps going out and out from there. And so when you're teaching, like, like when you're doing your youth work and stuff, are people generally pretty receptive and pretty tuned in from the beginning, or is it that one of the challenges? I think it's how you frame it. You know, one of the things that I do with whether it's four-year-old kids or whether it's 16-year-old kids or corporates. It's about how you frame the concept and how, how it can resonate and be personal to them. And I think as much as we talk about the Indigenous perspectives, which are important because I think Aboriginal people in, in this country have a very ancient, ancient concept of connectivity and understanding of that, that creation, our stories that we share are, are unexplainable by by Western society or even by science as to how we know those stories because they predate the numbers that they talk about, you know, our stories of millions of years old. When we describe a, a volcano that erupted and they go, you can't know that because that's two million years old. How, how is it that you know that that's actually the result of an underwater volcano? They, they go, how do you know that? And they say, that's, that's the stories that's been passed on. They just can't, they can't understand that. And they go, oh, you've only been here for 40,000 years. It's like, yeah, okay, you keep telling yourself that narrative. So when, but when we use it and construct it as this is a, an earthly practice, this is a human practice, this is not just about Aboriginal people, it's about all cultures on the planet had this knowledge at some point and used it and understood it. So when I say to people that if you lined up all our ancestors, if we lined up all of us in a line and then you went to our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents. I said, you go back seven generations and my people were living off the land, like traditionally on this side of my family. But on my mum's side of the family, if you go back, you know, 20 generations, they were living like my... But they still lived connected in with the knowledge of, of that. That's the same as everybody else, just some are more disconnected than others or remove more. So when you can you can actually get that to resonate, to say this practice is about you and this practice is about your ancestors, but it's also about the, the descendants that are going to come after you. And we always say, Sarah and I don't have children, but the children in our community, we still do the practice for their benefit so that the earth's going to be good for them. So it's for all children, not just for your own, 
but often that's how we get, say, corporate corporate males to respond to it. Because a lot of people go, yeah, I'm just living in the now. I don't care about tomorrow. I'm not going to be here. But, you know, you say to a lot of corporate, you got, you got kids, yeah. You got grandkids, yeah. Do you love them, yeah. What about your great-grandkids? What about your great-great-great-grandkids? Oh, don't care. I won't meet them. But if I could bring them here, would you love them any less because they descend from you? Oh, no, of course I'd love them. Well, what are we doing to look after them? So that's how it connects people all up because it's about a, having a sense of purpose. I think that the spiritual Zen thing is to find a sense of purpose. And surely the greatest purpose is a continuation of humanity through all what we're all doing. So if you can de-culturalise that and put it into a framework of humans and the, what we're supposed to do, that often gets people's attention because it's not about those Aborigines or those other little natives over there. This is about all of us and that we all breathe the same air, we all drink the same water, we all eat the same food from the land. So, you know, I think that that helps to, to connect to people when you, con- when you frame it like that. It's so interesting as well because all of the things that you do to make a better world in the future, all the things that actually make you feel better about yourself today, so yeah. even for the people who are just like, I'm living for the now, it's like, well, yeah, this is going to help your life in the now be better yeah. as well and be more meaningful. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's, I guess, the, I guess trying to get people to think about that, that, yeah, you'll definitely be better off now, but... More importantly, because, you know, we all descend from ancient lineages. We do. Mine have been straight a lot longer, but at the end of the day, your ancestors have all been here the same amount of time as mine. No one's been here any longer than anybody else. So, you know, unless you're an alien. <laughs> a few of politicians, maybe. But, no. <laughs> but, yeah, so it's about, yeah, definitely when you frame it like that, that we'll be better, we'll be better today if we eat more organic food and we look after our waterways and you know we res- connect and respect the land more and we'll definitely be better for that then yeah yeah and by default then so will future generations mm-hmm. be better off if for, even for those people living in the now if they start practicing wiapa they'll they will create a better world yeah the disconnected it will be a default mm-hmm. but for the connected it's a purposeful yeah, purpose. yeah come on and so when we were inside before, you mentioned that there's a couple of people you knew who were teaching WAPA in the prison system. Yeah. And so I'd love to hear a bit more about that. Look, I think that, again, it just shows the flexibility and the modality and how you can use the philosophies and the stories and uh, the principles to connect to people. And often the people that are in our prison systems are some of the most disconnected because their actions that have got them there are the actions of disconnected for whatever reason. And look, there's often, you know, people make bad choices or bad, you know, mis- they make a mistake and they might make it twice and it becomes a choice and they continue to make the wrong choice. So when you start to have framework around, obviously at the moment we're only dealing it with men, but putting back into these Indigenous men the, the construct and the concept of their ancestors and being a hunter and what was that, you know, the the grandiose idea of the noble hunter who went out and provided for his family and he was the protector, as sort of whimsical and fanciful as that sounds. They were. They were those people. They were, they were honourable, they were respectful, they took only what they needed, they only took what they were allowed to take, and they, if they wanted something, they traded for it or they bartered for it or they had it gifted to them. And when you put those, those constructs of identity back into people's lives, and, you know, as I was saying inside, was that a lot of these men feel uncomfortable about doing the passive flowing movements and the story and the narrative and the connection only because of the some of the worst forms of Western psychology and control of developing that toxic male of the whole macho and we don't do that, you know, that's for little girls or that's you're a pussy or this or that, that whole programming of that, the very worst of what males can be from that sort of side of it when you get them to come into contact with their, their softer nurturing energy as a man and what that really means, you know, to encourage them to connect to that. It has been having some really... Working within the structure of the system is very challenging to go into, you know, the, the boys that go into the... the young men that go into that space to teach it are constantly having to deal with lockdowns and issues that are happening, you know, codes this and codes that. So trying to get some continuity in that space can be challenging at times and guys dealing with different emotions of being in there, so trying to deal with emotions of being locked up and caged up. But giving him the concepts of using visualisation and meditation 
to help him cope with the, the, the cells and that and to be able to visualise himself out on country, out in the place that they connect to. So when you have a yarning circle, oh, bros, what's your favourite place that you connect to? And oh, the beach, you know, my people are saltwater people and we hunted and fished and, oh, right, well, when you go get locked down tonight, think about that. Think about your ancestors, think about the time your uncles took you there. Then all of a sudden they have this yearning for wanting to be home and not in jail. Mm. And then you can have the conversations, well, what got you here? What do you need to do to get you, keep you out of here? So when they go home and get connected to that place, that place inside isn't that appealing because they've got a connection to that place. So yeah, those are those are just we've only just really started doing it in the last seven months, mm. eight months. So it's sort of a new space to to take it to. But again, it's just a, it's a different space, isn't it? Yeah, it's like it's kind of the least nurturing and least connected to Mother Earth <laughs> section of the environment that you can think of. So it's like really amazing that you're bringing that in there and kind of reconnecting people to that, so that like when they come out, like they actually come out rehabilitated and not just like more damaged. Yes, and that that's the the plan to get them emotionally and spiritually rehabilitated, so that they can then work on the physical aspects and the, the other the other aspects that are continually leading them into that back to that environment that's the that's the plan and yeah it seems to having some really good traction with the conversation that the, the young followers yeah. are having in there you've mentioned a few times that these these movements and the philosophy comes from ceremony on country was there ever a decisions about should I share this? Should I not share this aspect because it's too sacred? Was there ever any resistance around sharing all of this to everyone? Or the knowledge, just... yeah. The knowledge the knowledge itself is the philosophies of connectivity. So there's no sacred dances that I'm sharing. And, and like with anything, you know, something from another culture, even another Aboriginal culture might say, oh, we can't do that movement because from here we don't do that. That's fine. And but that's the movement, it's the story behind it. You know, we don't tell any, there's no sacred storytelling, there's no sacred dance moves that if someone sees a movement, they go, oh, that's sacred for us. That was never intentional because we don't, that's not sacred to who we are or what we do. So all the movements are very nondescript movements. They're, you know, they're movements that all, all of my elders from my community have seen why, but they love it, they talk about it, they support it, they share it because ultimately it's about protecting and connecting to the earth and I'm yet to meet an Aboriginal person that wants people to do that about looking after country because that's what the modality is ultimately about. Like so, it's yeah. all really universal. Absolutely. So when, when we talk about the three different layers in which we teach it, the first one is environmental. So WIAP is an earth connection practice first and foremost. It's not a cultural practice. So we don't teach it as a cultural practice. I can share aspects of my culture as a, a way up a presenter, but I wouldn't expect Sarah to do that unless she had permission to tell my story. So it's about acknowledging the environmental connectivity that we have. So all those 14 elements are all elements that existed way before people. So there's no, that's just, as, that's just what it is. So there's no culture around that. Then we share it from personal. So what do you, how do you connect personally to those 14 elements? So, you know, Ryan, you would write down 14 elements, how you how you have a little story about what they mean to you. Mm -hmm. Sarah would do the same, Joe would do the same. And then I'd say, well, do you have any cultural stories that you might be able to put down there? And so I would have my 14 cultural stories, but that's just from Gippsland. I could do another 14 from Western District. 500 Aboriginal nations from across Australia would all have a different story for the 14 elements. But at the end of the day, they're still the same 14 elements. You could get every culture on the planet to write down their story and their meaning culturally to the 14 elements. It doesn't, doesn't matter, because they're the same thing. Call the sun Nanung, or call the sun Ra, or you call the sun the sun. It's still the sun, <laughs> you know? So it is, it's about the cultural overlays that just a, another way to share the story, to say, as humans, you know, we talk about being, I'm different because of this, or I'm different because of this. Really, we've got more in common than we have different as humans. There's more of us, there's more about us that we have in common than the differences. And and it doesn't matter how we see the story. And I say to Aboriginal people who say, oh, but I can't talk about the sun like that, then I say, well, don't talk about it like that. Yeah. <laughs> talk about what you can talk about. I don't want you to tell any secret stories. It's about sharing only what you can share. And people who do the right thing will only share the 
right thing. And we have these conversations when we deliver the course about cultural appropriation and where you get the knowledge from to share it. And it's about referencing, you know, we always say when you have a conversation with an Aboriginal person or with someone from, people go out and talk about Ra the sun god, but I've never, I learned that in school. Um, he wasn't an Egyptian teacher, he was a white follower, <laughs> but he was here teaching me about Ra and all the creations and all that. So it's about, you know, respectfully referencing where you get your stuff from and having first-hand conversation with people. So it's, again, it encourages people to go, if you want to learn more about my culture, then come and sit with me. Mm-hmm. Don't just read about it or hear it on a podcast and ring me up or email me or come and do a camp or something. And then you can share that story. So when a lot of people come to Uncle Mugi Sumner and they sat on country with him, all these non-Aboriginal people, he told them all the stories about the stars and everything like that. And he said, you can share these stories. I want you to share and reference these stories from my people because that keeps those stories alive mm. and it acknowledges him. So he'll only tell what he's allowed to tell. There's lots of stuff he won't tell. So, again, those people can go off and say, oh, well, when I was over, I went to do my upper, they're doing a sun element. Oh, well, Uncle Mugi told me the story about the sun. So that's how you can reference a cultural story that way rather than go, well, I Googled it and it yeah. said. <laughs> so there's all different ways you can gain knowledge and share knowledge, but... At the end of the day, that's not what way up is ultimately about. Even though you've just said it's not what it's ultimately about, I'd love to go back to what you just said about how if people do want to learn more about Aboriginal culture and especially non-Indigenous people, yeah. have you got some directions people would head to? Like, do you have any references or do you, did you say you do like a camp or...? What I would say to non-Aboriginal people is just get in contact with the traditional owners where you can. People say, I don't know where to start. And I say, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, we've got this interweb thing uh-huh. here now that, you know, you can easily find mm-hmm. things a lot easier than it might have been. But, you know, a lot of people, there are some communities where, unfortunately, the, the original peoples have been removed from those communities, you know. Well, is there, are there any other original people living there that might know the stories or the knowledge? So it's about, again, the word Waiapa is means to connect, means to go and join, it means to interact. So, again, being Waiapa with Indigenous people and having first-hand conversations, and it's even, even though we have an online platform to do the course and to you know we're looking at doing it so you can become an instructor online but at the end of the day real way up is about true connection is what we're doing now face to face not over phone not skyping feeling each other's energy in the room present reading what people uh, how they're receiving the information and that's true that's true indigenous connection is we're sitting on the ground we're sharing a cup of tea and we're yarning that's what we encourage people and melbourne is a great example of that i've got a lot of non-aboriginal friends that that do the Indigenous circuit, you know, there's lots of Indigenous things happening, especially in this part of the world, where you can go to Wurundjeri Week or there's lots of events on in Fed Square. And so, yeah, I just encourage people to go and meet the traditional custodians. And, and I know say, that the Wurundjeri people, like, they have a website. Yeah, it's really they, accessible. They you can just look yeah. it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I think that that <laughs> is the first start. And then actually go to some of the events and, and meet some of the people and, and just pay your respects. And, you know, and most, most traditional, original custodians will say thanks for acknowledging us and we just want you to look after country look after it you know? so i guess if people are feeling a bit shy and a bit awkward yeah it's like, yeah 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 just show up like, yeah 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 support show up be respectful even as an aboriginal person when i go to other aboriginal places i'm staying for a while i'll go to the, the traditional owner group and say are there any places that i shouldn't go to that might be men's sites or women's sites or of significance you know they people respect that no, people really respect that. Uluru is a classic example. I mean, they say don't climb the rock. People still climb the rock. Mm. It's like, yeah, yeah, there's a huge yeah. sign saying why. Traditional not. owners don't want you to climb it, but people still climb it. So that's not a good example of how to, you know, <laughs> not engage with them. So yeah, I think there's a lot that can be done because there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of stories and the intricacies of conversation and. Um, you know, making sure that, you know, giving yourself that opportunity to learn, I think is really important. So yeah, that's probably a a good start to to start the conversations and there's other avenues. And that's why with WIAPA is our our instructors are both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal. And you don't have to go with an an Aboriginal instructor to get a connection to the earth. Some of our non-Aboriginal instructors are amazing connectors of people to the awareness and they're amazing connectors to other Aboriginal people. And then Aboriginal people can bring another layer to it as well if they want to. So it's a, it's a good way of honouring Indigenous knowledge. It's a good start to, to understand it. 
<coughs> but then to be able to go, all right, I need to go to there or I need to go to there or to ask. Yeah, yeah so it's kind of like that's where it's coming <coughs> from, but it's something that's really universal to everyone because we all live on this earth, so... <coughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. So you mentioned that the movements that you chose to represent the elements are quite general <coughs> movements. Is that just something that came to you as like a stream of creativity or did you actually kind of sit down and workshop like, oh, this is going to be the rain and this is going to be the lightning? I'd love to know how it all came together. I think it just, I mean, Sarah probably has more of a memory than I do of five years ago when I first showed her in the lounge room and Sarah sort of, I mean, Sarah helped me tweak some of the movements and the sequencing, but at the end of the day, they were all just very explanatory of the connection of all those things. It was something that was already within you. Yeah, absolutely. Just expressing yeah, it. Oh, yeah. And I think that, I mean, I always talk about, oh, I always talk about this being a gift from the ancestors to me to share. And I've just been purely the messenger. They've just said, hey, you need to share this here, do it. And explain it like this, move it like that. And this, Sarah, I help you do it. <laughs> so we, we, we don't believe in coincidences. <laughs> we don't believe in coincidences. And so when, you know, I showed Sarah, she sort of, didn't have much of a reaction at the time. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you always say that. I, but then you were so moved by you couldn't speak. I was. That's I was actually saying. left speechless when he showed it to me because I was very disconnected. I had been on, I thought I'd been on a spiritual journey. I thought I'd started it. I had done, you know, yogas and tai chi's and meditations and uh, cranial sacral treatment, you know, all sorts of different treatments and alternative or complementary therapies, but I was still feeling there was still something, this void inside of me that just was like, I'm still missing something and I don't know what it is. And I remember we were in the lounge room, we hadn't long sort of moved in together and we were sitting there and I remember it distinctly that night. And I, and I said, so, you know, cause we were also, Jamie wanted to set up his foundation around culturally mentoring Aboriginal kids in traditional culture because he didn't have that opportunity. He wanted to make sure that other kids got that opportunity. He's like, so, you know, you're going to write all the submissions for me and do all the, you know, hard work of getting it funded. I'm like, oh, you know, that's really hard work. What else can we do to create an income stream? And he was like, oh, well, you know, I do do this thing. And he showed it to me, the, the movements. And I just was literally gobsmacked. I was speechless because I just, there, there was this deep connection that rang out through me. My, you know, my cells were just zinging, you know, the hairs on my um, arms were standing up and I was just like, oh my God, that's exactly what I'm missing. I'm missing my connection to my environment, to the land around me. And he understood that because as an Aboriginal person, there's this deep, deep, you know, unexplainable connection to the earth and to country. But as a very disconnected Caucasian person, I was just blown away going, yes, that's exactly what I need is that connection. And then a huge amount of healing came about for me personally as a result of putting it all together and then being able to share it. And yeah, I'm so much more connected now and so much healthier and happier and, and whole since having my for shared with me. And I guess that's a real impetus because you felt that effect mm. on you so directly. That would really carry you through the like more challenging times of getting something new off the ground or the times where it's just like writing grant proposals or doing that stuff Absolutely. that's not really that fun. <laughs> Absolutely. And because I was in a space in my life, you know, I'd been in a huge cycle of domestic violence relationships from the age of, you know, from when I could remember, I'd gone from one to the other to the other. I was a highly functioning alcoholic, you know, I was using alcohol for everything, you know, from happiness to sadness to boredom to, I was constantly searching, you know, feeling um, that there was this huge missing thing in my life, but never really knowing how to, to get there. And I knew that there was a lot of other people who felt like I did. There was a lot of other people living the way I was living because I've been bumping into them. And so when Jamie showed me my app, I was just like, oh my God, you just, you know, you need to share this with the world because the world needs this. The world needs this connection back to our environment, back to mother earth, you know, and I could just see it. The vision sort of was just like, wow, this is going to really change 
the world and it's perfect because it's coming from the world's oldest living people duh they actually knew how to do it you know they had that's, why they're, they're, stuff out. that's why they're the world's oldest living peoples because they had the knowledge you know so yeah so it's it was so it does sharing it and knowing how much it has helped me change my entire life and and just become so much more connected and whole and and you know have so much purpose and belonging in my life I want to share that and I just see that I was very much you know like Jamie I was I was a been guided by the ancestors to bring Jamie into my life and I know that that was the purpose was to create you know to be able to share this this amazing gift of Waiapa with with the world. And I think it must be so inspiring as well when other people are like in a dark place to see like it's not just like you've had this easy breezy life and no. now you've got something nice to share it's like yeah. yeah this is something that really changed things for me and I think like Absolutely. Other people will get the sense of that as you share it. Yeah, absolutely. To stop that cycle of domestic abuse, to increase self-esteem, to I haven't had a drink, you know, five, next year will be five years since I've had a drop of alcohol. All of these amazing oh, things. Oh, so is that about the same time oh, that yeah, you started yeah, no, this? Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Wow, Wyapa, amazing. Wyapa gave me, you know, it's, it gave me the, the, the purpose and the belonging. It gave me that understanding that I needed to understand that alcohol was blocking my connection to something far greater and and so yeah I mean I can't I, people who knew me back then <laughs> are like you know because I, I remember saying I couldn't even imagine my life not drinking and now five years later I'm like I can't even imagine drinking again like I just so don't need it because what my app gives to you is that clarity of connection it is just so much bigger than anything else that you could ever get from a bottle or a pill or a, all the other different ways that we numb ourselves through retail therapy, through gambling highs, to watching, binge watching, you know, Game of Thrones or whatever it might be. All of that, you just, you realize through this connection that you don't need any of that. It's that connection to, to Mother Earth and to your environment that just really sustains you. I noticed that you've actually, um, I want to get this right, you've just been recently approved as an official modality by the International Institute of Complementary Therapies. And I imagine that was probably quite a challenging process and a lot of paperwork to get approved. And from what you've just told me, it makes so much sense that you actually really do want to see this recognised as a therapy and not just as a movement style. What does that kind of recognition do for this as a movement yeah actually that was one of the first things we did so when Jamie showed it to me and I recognized why Appa to well, obviously we didn't know what it was called then we we decided we came upon the word why Appa. but when he showed it to me I was like oh my gosh this is a modality and to be able to bring you could say you could say all well, aboriginal people have been world's oldest continuous living culture so obviously they've got a huge amount of ancient wisdom about living life well but you can't necessarily translate that into a modern day context because these days we we put structures around everything so we want to, everything to be accredited in a western style way so to be able to give credibility to it we knew when we we're coming into this space of the wellness industry that we needed to to put that modality structure around it. And so it was probably, geez, it was probably almost five years ago. It was one of the first things we did was to actually go to the International <coughs> Institute for Complementary Therapists, find out what we needed to do to get it structured. And as soon as we started, you know, sharing with them what it was and that it was a totally unique modality that nobody else had, you know, even thought about or considered. And we put all of that onto paper they're like oh my gosh yeah and you know there's a process that you go through and you do that and then the next thing we had to do was then also become an approved trainer to be able to train wiper practitioners so we've done that too oh, congratulations yeah, that's fantastic <laughs> and so do you um i'm not sure if maybe you're already doing this but just from your own experience and seeing how helpful it's been like breaking the cycle of abuse and substance abuse like are you kind of reaching out to those populations or uh, look, not, not really. Not, not specifically. I mean, WAPA can, you know, absolutely help with all of those areas. And it's certainly something that, you know, we do have WAPA practitioners who are going into rehabilitation centres and sharing it. Um, we have practitioners. They weren't expecting that either. 
They weren't even expecting that. Oh, to go into that space. No, they were doing early childhood, child care. <laughs> and it just ended yeah. up, <laughs> so that's <laughs> where they were. I said, oh, this, this resonated in this space because that's what a lot of these people would yeah. need. I went to a gambling conference yes. and give a presentation the other day because it's about disconnection as to why people mm. are having these different addictions, whether it's gambling, drugs or alcohol, family violence or whatever. Yeah. It's all it's relevant all to disconnection. And the way I put connection back to is a greater sense of self and you know, directing it. So yeah, mm. people not necessarily were thinking, I'll use this medal just for this. This is something that went, oh yeah, it's like the prison stuff. Like, yeah. it just was like, that would just be so beneficial in prisons. It's like, yeah, it would be. But we do it to four-year-old kids in kindergartens, in aged care facilities, to corporates, to grade six kids, grade two kids, year 12 kids. Yeah, within the disability sector. Disability. Yeah, yeah I notice yeah. you have a sequence that can all be done from a chair. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, the whole WAPA movements can be done from a chair or as a visualisation. So people mm. can just watch it yeah. and then learn it visually and then practice it as a as a meditation, as a visualisation. Yeah, I guess it's this like universal human need, whether we know it or not, for mm. connection. So it's so beautiful that you've framed it in this way that really is accessible for everyone, no matter what their movement abilities yeah. are. Or I guess if people are really unwell as well, the visualisation would be so helpful. Absolutely. Mm. And using the, the visualisation and the meditation. But using the 14 elements to even construct their own stories, their own narrative. Each one of us did a did a tape recording of the 14 elements and what they meant to us or visualise the place. And that's the other thing is about the storytelling. So when we do the visualisations within the group, we get the participants to say, well, you take them, you take the visualisation tonight and take us to a place that, that you like to connect to and they might get you to close your eyes and they'll talk about a beach or they'll talk about a mountain and they'll describe it and they'll explain. And then you will visualise that place. You know, you may never have been there or you may have been there, so you know what they're talking about. But each each person will bring in a unique story or connection. That's really beautiful as well because it's kind of like there's that understanding as well of like, yep, you are significant, like your stories are important yeah. and they can help other people yes. as well. Yeah, yeah. And I think that the other thing too is, and that's what we were just talking to the young, young people this morning about, is that, say, a one-hour session, a one-hour way up a session might be broken up into a share then a practice, then a meditation or a visualisation and, and a conversation. It's not necessarily that one hour space is taken up on, yes, we'll do a visualisation or a meditation or yes, we'll do a movement practice, but it's about saying, well, how were you way up at today or this week? Oh, you know, did you see that massive rainstorm or how about that wind the other night? Oh, yeah, and then you start having conversations around the 14 elements. And where were you when you saw the eclipse? Or where were you when you saw the full moon? You know, and it's like, yeah, yeah, I was here. And then you start sharing these stories. But that's about getting people back to talking, to talking again. <laughs> you know, and I think we're losing the art of that because everyone's just mm. <laughs> so. You text me. Yeah, yeah. text me. Yeah. I text you the story. <laughs> so it's about bringing that human connection back, the human way up and back. Of, of, of sharing those conversations. So you know, a six week way up a course, you know, you might only do way up a, a 20 minute meditation each hour, but the rest of the 40 minutes, it could be a visualization, it could be a meditation, it could be sharing. Oh, I, I, I reuse my tea bags three, three times this week. <laughs> uh, save the environment, you know, I would normally have three boxes of teas, I only had, you know, one box because I bought these soap nuts. Oh, where'd you buy them from? I'll go to this website or and you start sharing resources, you know, about how you save the planet in your own little actions. So, yeah, it's, it's the sharing, that personal interpersonal sharing that I think that society's losing, those conversations. That's actually really one of the really amazing things about doing the podcast because we get to, like, connect with yeah. people like you yeah. and just, like, sit down and talk to people mm. without something else going on. Yes. Like, there's not, not even a meal or, you know, yeah, we're not yeah. busy doing something else. It's yeah, like you yeah. can just have the conversation. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Sure. And I think, like, I listen to podcasts as well, and even just listening to a conversation is so absolutely. enriching. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Because a lot of the time we don't actually listen very well, do we? <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, we, we put our own thoughts before actually listening, and I think that's another part of, you know, why Apple is it, it does really teach you to listen on a whole cellular level to your environment, not just seeing it or hearing it. It's, it's all of the senses. Um, and that deep understanding, the deep 
vibrational connection that we have to our environment and you know it's not just in a pristine rainforest that we get that connection we can go out in our backyards and get that connection even if we're living in the middle of the city yeah it's raining in our backyard right that's now right. Yeah. Yeah. how beautiful is it yeah but it's also and that's even for the guys in jail that they can still be connected here and knowing that even around them there's still rain falling outside yeah. they might not be able to see it they might even be able to hear it but life is going on whilst they're in there so using those visualizations but then going out i mean i would like to hope and think that they were getting out of their, their cells and they're having a meal with each other and they're interacting in the yard that they're talking about it they're talking about what happened. they're not talking about oh geez, i hate that screw or this is the food's crap or they're actually talking about oh, geez, I can't wait to get out of here so I can go back on country and catch a feed and teach my kids how to fish like I used to and I can't do that in here. So, again, it's about human conversation around positive positive connection. So, yeah, it's definitely a, a, a different, I suppose, different way of looking at a modality. Yeah. It's whole, whole of encompassing. And as a facilitator of all of that. I imagine when you go into those groups and into those conversations, you've got to be pretty like clear within yourself. Like if you went in there a bit stressed or a bit distracted, that stuff just probably wouldn't really land as well. Are there practices that you do for yourself to kind of like get in the zone when you're training teachers or when you're leading a group or is this something you try and not really get out of the zone? Like you try and just live like this all the time. Get in the zone. Yeah. We're, never, we're never out of Wiapa. No, we? no. no Wiapa. We there are breathe days, and breathe Wiapa. Yeah, <laughs> I, I say to people there are days I do a bit of a Katy Perry sometimes where, <laughs> you know, you've got a big presentation, like she has a big concert, and there might be all this stuff going on underneath, and then she comes up out of the floor, and you see her go from... To, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, you know, there's, there's a little bit of that because we're human. You know, we're human, we feel emotions and there are things that can affect us. But when you do, you know, I know for myself being the, the probably key presenter in my upper end, mm. our, our business, there, there is an element of that, but it's more of an attitude of gratitude of it's okay. You know, it is a bit the Buddhist philosophy. There is happiness, there is sadness, nothing lasts forever. And and, I, and it's also about, I love the saying, you know, where, where focus goes, energy flows. So, what you know, you are what you focus on. So, yeah, there are days when I've got a big presentation on and I might, I sleep so much better these days than I used to because my upper is a meditation, just knocks me out. And so, yeah, when I'm going into those spaces, you do have to be, you have to be aware that you want to be as clear and as concise and as interactive. And But you don't over, I, I personally, and when we teach the other instructors, we don't tell them how to do their thing. They're all their own people and they all have their own styles. But, but yeah, but it is about that self-care stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, it's looking in any space, but looking after yourself so that you can be the best version of yourself when you go out to present that. And today, I said to Sarah, I said, well, how do you think, because Sarah hadn't seen me do a presentation for a while. I've been doing a few solos, and I've been I've been doing really 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 well. <laughs> and it's not saying because you guys, what do you mean when I'm there you don't do as well? I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> but today I was talking about a six and a half, seven out of ten, whereas earlier in the week it was like a nine there. I was like, just it was everything was coming out of zone, and, and everything was just like, and and when I look at people, you know, I look for the pops, I look for the Oh, 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 oh. So that's when I know I'm connecting to people when you see their body language and their, yeah, 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 and you see them connecting. So, yeah, it was, it was fit today, it was Saturday morning, uni students, business, and I have a few go to little jokes that they just weren't laughing at. I was like, oh no, Comedy Central's around the corner, I need to get some tips. <laughs> but at least the teacher was laughing. <laughs> Maybe they were age appropriate jokes, I don't know. I tried to fill her off here for as many as I could get it. But anyway, but yeah, so I think, yeah, going into that space and the beautiful thing about Way Up Bar is you take your own knowledge in and you go in as a sharer of information, not as a teacher. So you don't go in there being the expert because no. you're not. You, you are just a sharer of your accumulated knowledge and it could be a lot, it could be this much and you don't try and think that you're better than anyone else. Yeah. I always say to people, I definitely say, I am not your guru. I'm not. <laughs> you are your guru. Oh, I think it's a and, massive red flag when someone says, I'm your guru. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I'm this <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and, and definitely having that humility to walk into that room and say, I am going to learn from you today. 
I'm going to share my story, but I want to hear yours. What's your knowledge about the rain? What's your knowledge about this? And I think that that is the, the, the space which also resonates because you don't have to be an expert. You just have to probably be willing to share your share your learned knowledge and experience and be humble in that. And, and as we say, you know, we can sit here and argue about that, the wetness of that rain, but it just is what it is. No matter how we see it, <laughs> we can say, oh, that's, that's only a drizzle. No, it's not. It's torrential. Or it doesn't matter. It's just doing its thing. So, yeah, I think that that also helps you with your presentation. Mm. So you, there's no expectations. Yeah, you're not trying to puff yourself up to being something more than what you are. You're just kind of like sharing what's real mm. for you and yes. trying to like get other people yes. to do that as well. Yes. The thing I really love and I want you to enjoy it. Yeah, so, just yeah, yeah. here, I'll share this with you and yeah, take, yeah. take away yeah. whatever you want to take away. You know, and, just... and I think it's such a journey as well, isn't it? Because <clears throat> you come, you know, as Jamie was saying before, you know, he, when we started this journey, he was, he was way more of a consumer than what he is today. He was a bit of a clothes horse and having the 14 pairs of shoes and the latest suits and all of that sort of stuff because he came from poverty. So he wanted, wanted, wanted. And then from the WAPA journey, you've become so much more mindful. And I think that it's always about the journey because you're constantly learning on it um, and you're constantly trying to, because there's nothing prescriptive about WIAPA, it is about just empowering people to keep learning and keep improving or keep, you know, trying different things and and sharing all of that knowledge that you're always in that space of, of continual gratitude and learning. So I think that that's the way I the journey never ever stops. And it's not like I'm a master. No, I've made it. I know. No, I'm I don't no, float no. on a cloud, no. you know, <laughs> drinking the sun's rays for my energy. I don't do that, and I don't pretend to do that. Yeah. I'm very very open with people about my lifestyle, and to say there are people that are living a far more environmentally conscious lifestyle yeah, than zero I am. Waste or yeah, 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 I know. I, we I, encourage. Yeah, like, we, we encourage, encourage that. that. Say that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. These are amazing. You know, I'm on a journey. I'm not there yet and it's about saying to people do it at your own pace and people go oh but you should be doing this and I go it's a non-judging modality you shouldn't be telling me to do something I'm telling you to do it at your pace so you know so people go oh I see what you're saying as opposed to it's about saying practice what you're preaching is about saying well I'm not judging you so that's what I'm practicing non-judgment but I'm sharing my story what I'm doing and if you're doing it far more environmentally friendly than me, good for you. Does it make you better? Does it make you different? It's just your journey. Share that. And I'm inspired by that and I'll do what I can do to keep continuing that, you know, lessening my impact. So I think that's helping people mm. get through some stuff. You yeah, know? definitely. It's that start with where you're at. Because yeah. I think if people, like, have this unattainable thing that they're meant to be, to be they just don't even start because no. it's just all too hard. All too and, hard. and Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think even, like, particularly around what is being greeny or environmental there's a lot of people that either that resist because of that perception of what it might be whereas we breach try to bridge that gap to say actually everybody is actually everybody is a greeny everybody can be environmental because it's just simply means you know taking a keep cup instead of using a disposable cup or using a straw a metal straw instead of buying plastic straws so all of these little steps start you down that path of greater good. And yeah, and then those little steps are just a habit, so you don't even need to think about doing that. So then you can be like, oh, okay, well, that was pretty easy. Next, now yeah. I'll, like, yeah. you know, stop buying this yeah. thing in packaging and start buying it in bulk instead yeah. or making it myself or something. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So everybody can easily, you know, sort of get way up and, and it's not held up as, you know, being, oh, my God, you've got to get to this stage before you can even consider yourself doing that. You know, it's, yeah. it's the little baby steps that count too that make a big impact. Yeah. Do you have a vision for the future of Waiapa Wada? Um, or is it more just an organic evolution? Are you just taking things as they come? Yeah, I, I think that that's, the latter is probably a much healthier, <laughs> healthier approach. Because, look, you definitely, we would love to see people of the globe, of all cultures, practising Waiapa in some form, mm-hmm. whether it be within the structured modality of movement and connection and conversation, or whether people are just consciously making better choices. And often we believe that the the template is very easily transferable across the globe for people to connect to. So mind, body, well-being starts with the the well-being of the earth. And so definitely 
you know, we would love to see people all over the world practicing Wayapa, both as a as a, a structured practice for well-being, but also just the benefits that the earth will have because people are connected to their environment and seeing change in in what they want. So. You know, I I didn't even though Sarah told me that it was going to be pretty big, and uh, it wasn't until um, the guy who'd give us our intellectual property advice around Wapa, he had been doing IP for forty years, and he was blown away by it. He said, "This is an internationally ready modality here." He said, "You know, you obviously got the challenge of marketing it because you're against the." The big three, you know, Tai Chi, Chugung and Yoga are well established in the wellness industry. He said, but this is going to resonate like you wouldn't believe once you get it out there. So, and it is a journey, like, you know, we have limited resources and, but the whole concept of Waiapa was to fund our foundation to teach traditional culture back to our kids. You know, initially Waiapa was a means to an end for me because it was. So it was like, you know, when I went to Sarah, I said, I want to teach traditional culture to these kids. I need some funding to do it. I'll give you 50% of what we make, but I need you to help me get the money so I can take these kids out on country and mm. have the, the vehicles and the tents and the, the time and that to do it. And that's when my app was born. And, you know, now it's just as an important part of my life. And that's a bit of a, I wouldn't say it was a curse because we're trying to run a foundation with all these kids <laughs> and then we're trying to deliver an internationally accredited business to the world, modality to the world. So, you know, we're juggling these faces and got a men's group and boys group tomorrow and it's about trying to do both because they're both really really important so yeah it's it's something we'd love to see happen we do believe in universal conversations we do believe in things will happen when they're meant to happen there's no such thing as a coincidence and yeah i think enjoying the enjoying the organic journey of how it's shared i think when russell said to me where do you want to see why be you know i always say you know i, I want to teach oprah and deepak you know i want to be sitting on the couch having a conversation with deepak chopra there oprah there because the audience that that would bring i think they'd be yeah. into it <laughs> do you know do you know the phone number yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, you can come with but yeah i think i really do i really do believe they'd be into it and mm. imagine then the leverage of having those people supporting what you're doing and having those conversations so we would love to be teaching i mean the thing is it's about if you can connect it to people who are influential obviously you know imagine if if you know Hugh Jackman was tweeting about it, I'm doing Wapar and or you know whoever Thor or what Chris Hemsworth was you know doing it. It's about leading people to to the right places and spaces. You know, imagine if our big basketball players who are earning hundreds of millions of dollars said to two shoe companies, "You're destroying the planet. I'm not going to take you 20 million a year for endorsements. I'll take 10 million a year from these guys because they're looking after it." Imagine if they said that. Imagine if these people of of such high profile, who the majority of people worship, go. You know, this is what we want. I think there'd be massive, massive changes. Obviously, it starts from us as consumers. When we send an email to Nike to say, I'm not buying your stuff anymore because you're destroying the planet. Imagine if the guy in Portland, Oregon, who's the CEO, starts getting these emails from this app saying, I'm not buying your stuff because you're destroying the planet. Then they start correlating the emails with sales. And he says, righto, when we get to a million emails from these people to say that, well, do you, do you want to change it? And we say, your email might be that change. There could be 999,999 emails sitting in his inbox. Your email might be the one millionth email. He goes, right, that's it. We're changing the way we're doing business. We're going to start looking after the planet because it's consumer driven. Mm. So from a global perspective, it's, you know, we live in a global village now where we're trading all our consumables all around the world. You know, what's happening in Chernobyl or Fukushima or wherever, you know, where there's environmental disasters, we're affected by it from the wind, from the rain, from the waterways. So it's about we need to get everyone on the same page as a global collective. And I think that that's where this is another conversational point of bringing wellbeing from ourselves to our village, to our global village, to intergenerational wellbeing. I guess as well it's like feeling good about what we're supporting, like yeah. putting our money and our energy into something that, yes. you know, is better for us yeah. and better for the planet rather than just, I guess, not thinking about it or, you know, knowing it and then yeah. 
Yeah. And, and I think that that whole conscious consumerism conversation needs to be tabled. No, it takes us twice as long to shop these days because we are going, no, nah, can't buy that. No, nah, can't buy that. Send an email to say, I'm not buying that. And it's also about saying, and people go, oh, I don't know where to get it from. It's like, yes, you do. You jump online and you Google it and you can buy it. You bought that online the other day, you can buy that online. So it's about encouraging people to be conscious consumers. That's all we say. Be aware of what you're consuming and the impact it's having, whether it be from the tea that you buy to the shoes that you wear to the plastic container or the whatever. Just be conscious that you're making an impact. And I think that the whole Woolworths, Coles, sorry, sorry, Woolworths, the whole Coles backflip on their plastic bags, mm. it was silly. Don't, don't make such a hard decision and then go back because a few people were like, oh, on a bag. It's like... They went for, you know, 700,000 years without a bag from your shopping centre. They can take a bag, you know, what's the what's the end of the world? Like, yeah. I just, I'm not really disappointed on that. But then I won't shop there. I had a fellow say I took a box here the other day and I went, that's great. I personally am not going to shop there anymore because that's my stance. But if you want to take your own bag there and say I'm not taking your plastic bag, great. You know, so, yeah, I think that having, yeah, those conversations around how you can do it and encourage and that is is what, you know, again, it's about, you now here we are talking about a wellness modality, but yet we're talking about intergenerational well-being and consumerism and change, and they're often not the conversation spoken about when you talk about Tai Chi or Qigong mm. or even yoga at some point, you know. Mm. We wouldn't be having these conversations. And I guess it comes back to, like, with people's stories. Mm. It's like you're important, you're significant, like you can make yes, a difference can, in the world. Yes, absolutely. And it is that the Gandhi be the change that you want to see in the world you have to do it I love the meme there's a there's a great photo a great yeah. cartoon it's broken into two screens and this guy on a lectern he's got this whole crowd of people and he's saying who wants change and everyone's like yeah and then he goes who wants to change <laughs> <laughs> no one yeah <laughs> crickets yeah. I see it a lot <laughs> yeah we all want it but we don't really want to do it yeah, it's a bit hard, <laughs> it's a bit hard yeah. you know? but that's that is the human collective of what's happening we have to you have, you have, you have to, to put in the work yeah you have to put in the work you know it won't just happen magically we have to put in the work and I think that that's where you know, once you get people back to that then convenience is what killing is what killing is killing us convenience and especially even in the last 20 30 years Convenience is what's destroying the planet. Mm. You know, we've just gone so backwards in the last in our lifetime, probably more in ours, probably a bit older than you guys. But I know in the in the seventies and eighties, geez, nowhere near the convenience that we have nowadays. Just it's gone so quickly, so fast. But and some of the out. stuff, like some of the packaging stuff, it's not even more convenient. Like you know, if you buy something oh, and it's like super no. sealed in like yeah. a hard plastic thing, yeah, it's like really hard to get it. You're like, like oh, this? Yeah. Yeah. how many yeah. layers? I know. How many layers do you really need to put to protect that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to protect that thing that's made out of plastic anyway. I know, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I live next door to an amazing organic shop, you know, like even trying to, you know, even if you go to those big supermarkets to buy organic food, it's all wrapped mm. in plastic. Oh, and, and they wrap in... the organic stuff more than they, the conventional and, and stuff. The thing, and the thing is, is like the guy said, it's because it's organic, it will go off if we don't. I'm like, hey, I get that. So there's this whole like argument yeah. about I want my organic bananas but if they weren't wrapped, they would have gone off two days ago because they're not injected with chemicals to keep them fresh for longer. Oh, I so thought it was just... just so people didn't, like, steal them and put them through as conventional bananas. <laughs> Maybe there's that too. <laughs> yeah. But that's what he said to yeah. me. So, yeah, there's probably mm-hmm. even that conversation. But, I mean, I could pull it out of the wrap and leave it there and put it, I can do that now. Or, no, like, like, there's, like, sweet corn that <laughs> yeah. comes in its own natural package <laughs> that they take <laughs> off and put it on a plastic tray and wrap it in plastic. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. So, yeah, look, there are all these little idiosyncrasies we have to work through in the world, yeah, to, to, to try and find a balance, really. Yeah, and we were talking this morning at the workshop about how things have just been created for us, you know, so we are talking about the fact that a lot of single-use stuff has been created. We are made to think that we need to have it because it's better, but that's only because of the marketing that's been put around it. So we talked about Kleenex, you know, tissues, Kleenex, created an entire product just for their own betterment, financial for, benefit. for financial mm. betterment. And hankies, 
Mm. Yep. <laughs> like, how, they're fine. Why can't we use hankies? But there's been a marketing concept that's been put around Kleenex that it is healthier, it's cleaner, it's more germ free, all this sort of stuff. And it's like, that's just marketing. Mm -hmm. It's just the spin around it. But we've all been so sucked into the marketing and the advertising. Yeah. And it's about pairing it all back and saying, really, is it? Or what's it really about? It's actually about you trying to sell a product. And I'm going to go back to a hanky because I get to, I can use it multiple times and then I can throw it in the wash and it's done, you know? So I think it's really just changing, being really mindful around everything and making sure that we're understanding where that purchasing habit comes from and whether do we really need it. Yeah, I think the worst of that is the beauty industry because to create a need for their product, they'll like actively destroy someone's self-esteem and yeah. make them think that they're not good enough yeah. so that they'll like yeah. buy a product yeah. or like I look know. a different way. Yeah. I know and we actually, I mean, I stopped wearing makeup four years ago after doing WIPA. I was, you know, I grew up in North America. I was by the age of, you know, going into grade five, I was getting up an hour early to put on my makeup and do my hair with my twirling wand. So was I. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for my entire life, I'd been programmed that I had to wear makeup. And one morning I just woke up and said, why am I doing this? Why? You know, it's the same with my hair. And I wasn't only until, it was probably only until a few months ago that I was like, why am I dyeing my hair? You know, I was using some organic. I would, by that stage, I'd been using organic, um, you know, hair dye. But even then I was like, oh, but why? Why am I dyeing it? Because I've taken the gray out, but why is gray back? You know, I've been programmed to think that I, I, if I'm gray, I'm old or I'm going to be less attractive <laughs> or less sexy looking at Mr. Gray. I mean, but men, men are okay to be gray, right? But women aren't. It's chrome. Man. I'm like a Harley. It's chrome. <laughs> But there's this whole conversation I think that yeah. needs to be had about paring it down and saying what is what what are we being programmed to think? Yeah, and that's what I said about the fashion industry before. You know, people say they'll say in the suit make it's the man. You know, and it's the manners that make it's the man. You know, and they they're free. It is going to behave. So yeah, I, I think that those conversations are really worthwhile having with the modality because they're really important conversations. You know, they're real. They're authentic. What's the one core thing you'd want people to most get from your teachings if you could distill it down to one essence, if that's even possible? Uh, I, for me, for me, it really is about intergenerational well-being. So being white, but being connected to con conscious consumerism is because you're going to be better for it personally because you're buying organic food and you're thinking organic thoughts and pure, you know good thoughts and you're taking care of you know the environment and if you're connected to it understand that that rains rain and you get wet then that's okay but yeah so for me it is about being connected to your own imprint on the planet because that's what it's about for me it is about saving a space for for future generations to take up so people hear this podcast and uh, you know start to think about their own their own impact and their own you know footprint and having conversations about it um, I'm, I'm, feel, I'm good with that. I'm, I'm good with that. About you, boss? Do you want? <laughs> yeah, I think for me, it's, it's yeah, absolutely connection. And it's the ongoing connection. You have to have earth, mind, body, spirit all together. You can't take any of them out of the equation. They're all connected. And as soon as one of them is taken out of the equation, then you're not well. So I think that that connection to taking care of, of the earth, which then takes care of us and our well-being. It's that forever circle that's so important. We'll definitely be putting your website in our show notes. Is there anything else that you'd like to share? Any other places people can find you or any upcoming events? We do have an online course, which is called Reconnect the Disconnection with WIAPA, which people can find on our website under the online course. We also have two WIAPA practitioner courses coming up. So this is a, the diploma course. It's a seven day diploma course, which is held at Melbourne Museum. And we've got one in November from the 19th to the 25th of November. And then we've got one in December from the 4th to the 10th of December. There's only a maximum of 10 places for both of those courses. So details again can be found on our website and then our, what 
WAP practitioners as well. We have on our website under the directory, practitioners directory, we've got a listing of all of our practitioners that people can have a look at, check out where the practitioner is, you know, living closest to them. And they all have their own things happening as well. They all run their own workshops and courses and doing a great job of sharing the WAP message. Thank you, Thank so, you so much. much. It's yeah. been so great to meet you and to talk to mm. you. Mm. It's been a great yeah no it's nice been yeah time. Have it has chat. it is and we do appreciate people's airtime you know you your podcasts uh, every, every every podcast that we do people are, are in this space you know we we're grateful that people will want to have conversations with us and especially from for me as an Aboriginal person finally people are wanting to listen and and learn about the knowledge and the richness um, for a long time we were a forgotten voice in this and when people finally understand that there's a lot to be, you know, shared and a lot to be learned from our mob, it's, yeah, it's a great opportunity. So thanks for inviting us here today. Oh, thank you so much for sharing. We appreciate it so much. And I just want to thank Sarah too. She um, <laughs> has, no, I don't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> she gets embarrassed when I thank I her, but I do because I, I, she's helped me in my own healing journey, but to, to bring something I didn't realise of such significance to the to the space to that can be shared to the level it can be shared. You know, it is uh, an amazing thing and I couldn't have done it without her. I couldn't have done it without the, the knowledge and the passion that she's had for just the found not just the, the business but our foundation as well. So I always acknowledge this amazing woman here. So yeah, thank you. I mean as you can tell the gi- the gift from Wapa and, and the knowledge that Jamie has, it needs to be shared with the world. Mm. It really does, you know, the world's missing out by not having, not listening to Indigenous knowledge and connection practices. It's time. It is. It it's is. time. And just from observing the two of you, you seem like a pretty formidable team, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we always say it's why Apple work. <laughs> <laughs> For the listeners, why Apple is Jamie and Sarah's work. <laughs> No argument here. <laughs> I can't deny that. <laughs> but he's got the knowledge, so you know what? I'm happy. As I said at the beginning, Jamie and Sarah are doing some amazing, important work, and I wish them nothing but success in getting Wayapawadik out into the world. I think there's a wealth of wisdom held by Indigenous communities in Australia and all over the world, and that it is wonderful that this local knowledge and this wisdom is being seen by the world, by the community at large. Now, we would really love to hear from you. So if you had any feedback or comments about this episode, you can reach out to our website at podcast.flowartist.com or search for the Flow Artist Podcast community on Facebook. We would absolutely love to hear from you. All right, so I don't want to jinx this, but our next guest is going to be Jay Brown, host of Jay Brown's Yoga Talks. Now, I say I don't want to jinx it, because we haven't actually recorded the interview yet. That's happening tomorrow, but I'm really excited. He is one of the most popular yoga podcasters out there, so we're really looking forward to having the opportunity to have a bit of a chat with him. All right, so the theme song in this podcast is Baby Robots by Go Soul and Use with Permission. Do yourself a favor and get his music from gosoul.bandcamp.com. We'll see you again in a fortnight. Aruha Nui, big, big love.